won her heart. And she said, why? why? Why would you do this to me? Why would you be so friendly and so kind? And then he tells her, it is because he has heard everything about her. He knows about what has happened to her, how that she has, in spite of the fact that, um, okay, in spite of the fact that uh, all this has happened and, and she is still young, she can still marry, uh, she has not abandoned her old mother-in-law. Right? She sticks by her. She's still taking care of her. She is working hard. And you know, when we do our best to stick with God's plan and to continue to be diligent to move forward, you, you realize that others also take note and they come along to help. Yeah. Now, Boaz wasn't the only one that took notice because when she came back with all that, Naomi notices wow how did she come back with so much and and that was when Ruth explained to her where she went and that she ended up in the field of Boaz now she has no idea who Boaz is but Naomi instantly recognizes that name this is a relative of ours right he is related to Elimelech and Naomi from the depths of despair in this deep, dark tunnel that she's sitting at the bottom of, she now sees a ray of light. She sees that the hand of God has been working. Right? That the Lord's hand is in all this, that this is not merely a coincidence. This is no mere accident. And so she tells Ruth, it is good. This is a blessing. And, and she remarks that God has not forgotten them. Right? That the Lord has not left off his kindness to the living and to the dead. Okay? God has continued to remember not only the dead, right? referring to her husband and her two sons, but also to the, the, those who have survived, Ruth and Naomi. God has not forgotten about them. God, God, the Lord has not forsaken them. Amen. And so she tells Ruth, stick to this place. Right? When God has been doing something, when the Lord has been blessing, stay there. Remain there until He moves us. Last night in chapter 3, we saw how Naomi, in, as they run through to the end of the barley harvest and the wheat, the, I think was it, the wheat harvest, what happens now? That she realizes there is another way to move forward. Why? She did not want her daughters-in-law to stick around with her because Naomi says, I'm already too old. I can't give you any sons. Even the odds of me getting married and, and being able to have sons, is it, are you prepared to wait that 20 years or so? Right? So she was very grieved is it, for their sakes. But now she sees that there is another way. That, that instead of being boxed in previously, according to our own understanding, many times we see that there are walls, that there's no way out, there's no way we can move forward. Now Naomi sees there is another way. Why? Because there is a kinsman redeemer. Yeah. Boaz. And she tells Ruth to go to Boaz, right, to meet him, Okay, and that was a window of opportunity that night as they celebrated the feast of the harvest, that he would sleep there on the threshing floor, that she was to go to him and then to present herself, right, as ready and willing to come under his protection and providence and as for him to be her husband. Why? Because he is a near kinsman. Okay? Again, another of God's laws. In God, in His wisdom, have provided a way where the name, the family line, will not be extinguished. Why? Through a kinsman, one who is near of kin, who can buy, redeem, and then give an inheritance to bring, raise up children who will carry the family name of the dead that family name will not be forgotten. And so he comes to, she goes to him. Now both of them have, in, in their 
in their relationship, friendship, there was a, also a growing mutual attraction. And she comes before him and says, Marry me. Boaz is humble. He tells her, You are kinder to me now. You have shown great kindness more than when we first met. Why? Because he tells her that she could have had her pick of any young man, whether rich or poor. And yet she came to him to do the right thing as under God's law rather than, you know what, that she can, she has, the odds are in her favor. Right? She could have just married anyone. She did not. She could have followed her heart or she could have followed the money either way, but she did not. But then, so Boaz indicates his willingness. But, he says, but there is one problem. What was the problem? There is another person who is a nearer kinsman than him. And we can come so close and yet be so far. All right? Their dream, their dream for both of them was about to come true and then there is a hitch. And here comes the test for each and every one of us because we are tempted very often to take things into our own hands to make things happen rather than to stick with God's plan, God's design to obey Him and yet run the risk that maybe things will not go the way we want. But Boaz is resolved that we will do the right thing and we will let God settle this because then he will go to the, that near kinsman and if that kinsman will marry Ruth and redeem that land, then so be it. They will submit to God's plan. If he will not, he will marry her and they will still obey God's plan. But the whole point is this, we will have to do it God's way. And when she returns back to Naomi, Naomi says, okay, good. This man, he will not rest, he will not stop until this business is finished. Let's wait to see what God is going to do. Now, Naomi's counsel to Ruth at the end of chapter 3 is very different from the way she and her husband would have decided on matters in chapter 1. Right? Because now you see that she understands we're going to stick with it even if we cannot figure out how it's going to be done. But God's plan is God's plan. We're going to do it His way rather than take things into our own hands. They took things in our own hands before. They left Israel. They went to Moab, right? Seeking a better future. And what Naomi knows this. She became bitter. Why? Because she lost everything. She's not going to repeat the same mistake again. And she tells Ruth, you wait. We're going to see... In other words, and this is something over and over again we've, when we face those kind of situations before, my wife says this, I don't know how it's going to work, she tells me, but I can't wait to see what God is going to do. So we see here now in chapter 4, the blessedness. All right? There is a summons to a meeting and Boaz waits patiently for this meeting to happen. Look at verse 1. Then went Boaz up to the gate and set him down there. All right. So Boaz comes up to the gate of the city, a place where business is done, where transactions are, are made. All right. And he sits there and waits. And then it says, And behold, the kinsman of whom Boaz spake came by, unto whom he said, Oh, such a one, turn aside, sit down here. Right? He calls out to that near kinsman. He says, come, come, come. Let's sit down. We have something to talk about. And he turned aside and sat down. Boaz waited patiently and then Boaz proposed the redemption of the land. Right? He sits this near kinsman down. Now he gathers 10 other men of the elders of the city. Now the elders will sit there at the gates of the city. Um, they are there to uh, oversee various things including transactions to be witnesses and all that. All right, uh, today we will have the equivalent of the justice of the peace all right, to be signatories for all sorts of things. Now, he takes these 10 men of the city, all right, the elders, and said, sit ye down here, and they sat down. 
Now this kinsman understands this. There is a business deal going on here. And he said unto the kinsman, verse 3, Naomi that is come again out of the country of Moab, notice, selleth a parcel of land, which was our brother Elimelech's. Okay, this Naomi has a piece of land, right, that belongs, it's in the name of Elimelech, and she has this up for sale. So look at verse 4, it says, And I thought to advertise thee, saying, Buy it before the inhabitants and before the elders of my people. So Boaz comes up to this kinsman and says, Look, I'm giving you first right or refusal. I'm letting you know. Right? I'm telling you, buy this. Right? It's up for sale. He's first in line, this kinsman. Right? He says, buy before the inhabitants and before the elders of my people. Then he says, but if thou wilt redeem it, redeem it. Okay? If you're going to buy it, redeem it, do so. But if thou wilt not redeem it, then tell me. In other words, he's telling this, this near kinsman now, he says, okay, this land is up for sale, you decide. All right? But I need you to make a decision because if you will not buy this, then I will buy it. So you need to decide. Are you interested, yes or no? All right? This is that I may know, for there is none to redeem it beside thee, and I am after thee. All right? It says, if you will not do it, I'm the next in line. This is after. So now, what was his reply? He says, and he said, I will redeem it. Now this offer was witnessed by the elders of the city, right, so that this will be legitimate. This is not a private deal. This is not something that after they transacted, uh, one of them could say, oh, I didn't, I didn't say anything. I didn't agree to it. Right? This, there were witnesses there. Right? These were honorable men. Now he made full disclosure of the land. He says this is for sale, that he will be redeeming it, which belonged to Elimelech's family. And then he gave this near kinsman the first right of refusal. I want us to see something that Boaz was very honest in his dealings. Are we honest in our business dealings? Are we honorable in our dealings? He could have, okay, Boaz could have kept back some of the information. He made a full declaration, right? The kinsman indicated that he would be interested in redeeming the land for his own possession. He says, I will redeem it. Now, it's in verse 5 that then Boaz reveals the small print in the contract. All right? It says there are implications if you do this. Right? He has clearly established that the kinsman is interested in purchasing the land. Now it says, okay, now, number two. But in verse 5, it says, Then said Boaz, What day thou buyest the field of the hand of Naomi, thou must buy it also of Ruth, the Moabitess, the wife of the dead, to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance. It says, you're not just buying this from Naomi. The day that you buy this land, you're buying it from Ruth. And when you buy it from Ruth, you have a legal obligation as under the law of God Right to raise up the name of the dead. Okay? Marlon's name will be preserved. The firstborn, he must marry Ruth, and the firstborn will carry that inheritance. It will be in Marlon's name, not his name. You get what I'm saying here? In other words, it's like when you, if you should do this as the redeemer, your first son will not carry your family name, but will carry the name of the dead. God had provided a way such that the family name will never be erased. Okay? This is for couples that are childless. And here, Boaz makes it very clear. Okay? You're not just buying land. You have an obligation to roof. That you must marry her and give her a son and that son will carry on Malon's name. 
Are you prepared to do this? Verse 6. Okay? The, and the kinsman said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I mar mine own inheritance. Redeem thou my right to thyself, for I cannot redeem it. Right? Now, so in, in setting this up and then and presenting this information, now, Boaz established, it was very clear that the buyer was not interested in being the redeemer, right, in raising up the name of the dead. Okay? Now, many would be, many might be actually open to the idea, wow, I can get, I marry a young, pretty wife, but raising up a family and having children, and then they, they will carry on that, in, that the inheritance will not be in my name. No, 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 hang on, hang on. Right? There will be a responsibility that will come, not just in the purchase of land, but uh, towards Ruth, and this kinsman was unwilling and unable to do so. Okay? Because in the kinsman redeemer principle, the kinsman okay, needs to be a near relative, but he must be willing. He must be able to do so, and he must be willing to do so. And that was a picture of Christ as our kinsman redeemer, that he came in human form, right, just like us. He was willing to leave his throne in heaven, right, to die the death on the cross, to humble himself as a servant. Why? To be, to, so that we can have redemption through his blood. He has to be willing to do so. He has to be able to do so. He has to be a qualified, perfect sacrifice. That's why John the Baptist, when he saw Jesus coming, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Now, the Lamb of God, when you offer a lamb for, the, for his sacrifice for the Passover, it must, there are qualifications to that lamb. It must be male in the first year without blemish. Picturing the sinlessness of Christ. Now, here... Anyone who wants to buy out that land must also take root. It's a complete package. You can pick and choose. All right? And the child that will be raised up will be, the son that will be raised up will be carrying Marlon's name, not this kinsman. Now, Think about this. There was a sequence to the way Boaz presented this because this was to make it clear. All right? Because if he did it the other way around, okay, if he mentioned roof first, then the purchase of land. Now, it can be said that it can be said of him, of Boaz, that he was only interested in marrying Ruth to acquire the land. Okay. But for Boaz, buying the land was merely a bonus because why? He and Ruth wanted to share their life together. And he was prepared to do this, to raise up an inheritance in Marlon's name. So what happens? This man, this near kinsman backs out of the deal and then now they seal the agreement. Look at verse 7. Now this was the manner in former time in Israel concerning redeeming and concerning changing. Right? For to confirm all things, a man plucked off his shoe and gave it to his neighbor, and this was a testimony in Israel. So what happens now? They, they were going to sit, settle down. They're going to s sign and seal the agreement. Now what was the way they were doing? They would do it. It's not with a signature. They took out the shoe and they gave it to the other party. Why? Because if ever there was a dispute, right, Cedric would come and say, is this not your shoe? Alright, and so he would pluck out his shoe and give it to him. Alright, I, I don't know how he would go home. But, uh, but this would be a confirmation of the agreement. And so they sealed the agreement with this. Therefore the kinsman said unto Boaz, buy it free. Uh, for thee, so he drew off his shoes. So, so now the near kinsman said this, right? He's a closer relative than Boaz, and he says, "Okay, I will not 
okay, I'm not going to buy this land, right? I will not be redeeming this. And just to prove it, he took, takes off his shoe, he gives it to Boaz. Why? Because now this kinsman cannot come back later and say, wait a minute, you tricked me, you misled me, or I never said that. Okay, there was proof of this. So, the elders and the people nearby witnessed the land purchase. Verse 9, And Boaz said unto the elders and unto all the people, Ye are witnesses this day that I have bought all that was Elimelech's and all that was Chilion's and, and Malon's of the hand of Naomi. So they, this is now signed, sealed, and then it's confirmed, verified, witnessed by all these people. Right? Uh, what was it last month at the wedding? What happened? There were witnesses that had to sign. Right? There were witnesses at the wedding. Okay, so Boaz now officially redeems all that belong to Elimelech, Chilion, and Malon from Naomi as the next of kin. Right? Everything that Naomi owned. And then now he makes this declaration that he will carry on Malon's name. Look at verse 10. Moreover, it says, Moreover, Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of Malon, have I purchased to be my wife. Acts 20, what did Paul declare? He tells us that it was God who purchased his church with his own blood. That when the Lord Jesus Christ shed his blood at Calvary, what did he do? He purchased his church. This is his bride. With his own blood. That gives you an example of what a husband ought to be willing to do for his bride. Our Lord laid down his life for his bride. Men, what are you prepared to lay down for your wife? Hmm? Because it's so often we it's easy for us to put ourselves first. Christ's example was what? She came first. Here, he says he, he, he will do all this to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance. Okay? Now, in other words, he didn't just do this for the sake of Ruth, but for the sake of the dead. Malon. The family name will continue. All right, that the name of the dead be not cut off from among his brethren and from the gate of his place. Then he says, ye are witnesses this day. All right, the people there said, they are your witnesses, this is what I will do. You will notice one thing about, about even in the marriage is this, it is always a public thing, not a private thing. They are witnesses to this. Why? Witnesses to the commitment that these two people will make. You cannot back out of that. Like, well, you know, that was at the heat of the moment. You know, I, my, I, you know because of my feelings, I got carried away. And you see, the problem today is that we have a lot of those kind of Las Vegas weddings. Two people, half drunk, go, they stand before the minister who looks like Elvis, and then they conduct the wedding, and then that's it. Instant wedding, instant divorce also. Here, this was... We, we, before witnesses, why? There will be an accountability. The people there give their, offer their blessings and their approval. Verse 11, And all the people that were in the gate and the elders said, We are witnesses. All right? Then they pronounced their blessing. The Lord make the woman which is come into thine house like Rachel and like Leah, which too did build the house of Israel. Right, Rachel and Leah, right, the wives of Jacob, right, who through their children, now you see all the children of Jacob become the, the children of Israel, 12 tribes, right, and they pronounce it, oh, that your wife will be productive and she will be fruitful and that you will have many children. This, that did build a house of Israel, do thou worthily in Ephrata and be famous in Bethlehem. Wow. What a blessing. This is, and let thy house be like the house of Pharaoh, whom Tamar bear unto Judah of the seed which the Lord shall give thee of this young woman. So they were witnesses, 
all right they offered their blessings this was solemnized all right Boaz did okay everything that Boaz ha- had to do in his as far as his intentions were made very clear it was out in the open there was nothing hidden so they pronounced their blessings right that Ruth will be fruitful will give Boaz many sons Rachel was mentioned who was greatly beloved by her husband Leah was the one who was very fertile she had many children they blessed Boaz right that he will be famous now verse 12 I, if you look at verse 12 it's very interesting because then they said that you notice know and let thy house be like the house of Pharaoh's whom Tamar bare unto Judah of the seed which the Lord shall give thee of this young woman. Who is that? Perez is the son of Judah. Okay? But the son that came out of a very messy situation. Why? Because Tamar was Judah's daughter-in-law now this was a kinsman redeemer type situation also because what happened was this her husband died was wicked God killed him because she had no seed no son what happens the responsibility fell on the brother-in-law to raise up seed and an inheritance he refused to do so God killed him Judah was not ready to allow his youngest son to die. So he just told his daughter-in-law, you just sit there and wait. You wait. And she took things into her own hands. Right? Dressed, pretended to be a harlot. And then what happens? Judah had an encounter with her. She got pregnant. Later when it became clear that she was visibly pregnant she was brought forth for Judah to be stoned to death and then she revealed this this is whose rings and whose bracelets are these she identified him you are the father he said to his daughter-in-law she's more righteous than I am why? because there was a responsibility to raise up an inheritance unto the dead but he was not willing to do so to allow his youngest son but listen Pharaoh is an ancestor going down all right all the way if you follow the genealogy all the way to Jesus Christ it will be out of Judah that the scepter will come forth the the ruler the king of Israel will come forth Okay, it was through this very messy relationship that David and then right, the Lord Jesus Christ all came from that family background. I don't know about you, but do you see an application here? How can this be a how can they make reference to this and then this was a blessing? Now, Tamar was, happened to be a Gentile woman. She and Ruth will be two of the four Gentile women that are mentioned in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Every one of them, of these women, including Bathsheba and Rahab, okay, these are the four have a pass and yet here this was the pronouncement of the blessing and let thy house be like the house of Pharaoh's whom Tamar bear unto Judah of the seed which the Lord shall give thee of this young woman they recognize Ruth is a Gentile but there was a blessing and I want us to realize something here that even in the messy situations God is able to turn a mess into something he will bless he's able to do that he can turn that 
And I want to remind everyone here, many of us here today, we sit here and we wonder, how can God ever use us? And why? Because look at our past, look at our family, look at how messed up things are. Look at my life before, before I was saved and there's a mess. You can't get any, mess, any messier than the fact that Ferez was the son of a father-in-law and a daughter-in-law. How messed up is that? Do you, do you see something here? God can use Ferez and the, his descendants right, all the way to David and all the way down to Jesus Christ. And you and I have nothing to be ashamed of, of our past, our family background, our history, whatever. Everybody here, before we're saved, has a past. This was pronounced as a blessing, not as an insult to mock Boaz. And realize this, whatever God takes, He can change. And whatever He, he changes, He can use for His glory. So then my question is this, what are, why are you and I still allowing the past, my background, our history, right, our family situation to hold us back? There was a celebration there with the people as they pronounced these blessings. This was to be a new beginning for Ruth and Naomi. Only God can take a mess and turn it around and to turn it into something beautiful that He can use. It doesn't, it doesn't give us license to do as we want or to live as we wish. All right? But understand, it was through this, the descendants of Pharaoh, that the scepter, the crown, and the, that rod to rule Israel was going to come from that family line. And many of us will say, oh, how can you serve God? How can you bring glory to God? Look at your family background. Look at your situation here. Oh, look at all the things that, you know, what your father, your grandfather, whoever, oh, disgraceful. But God's going to use it. So what is it to you? Matthew chapter 1. Look at the genealogy. It says, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham beget Isaac, and Isaac beget Jacob, and Jacob beget Judas and his brethren. Look at verse 3. And Judah beget Perez and Zerah of Tamar. His daughter-in-law bore his children. You know something about the word of God is this. I love the honesty of God's word. God tells it like it is. He doesn't sugarcoat anything. The good and bad, they're all displayed there. They're all put out there very open and honestly. Right? You read the biographies of men and what will happen is this. Usually, men will try to make themselves look good even in a bad situation. Here, he lays it out. It says, Judah, Pharaoh, of and Zerah of Tamar. That's his daughter-in-law. Shocking. Scandalous. And Pharaoh beget Esram, and Esram beget Aram, and Aram beget Aminadab, and Aminadab beget Nason, and Nason beget Salmon, and Salmon beget Boaz of Rahab. You know who's, who's, okay, do you know who's the mom of Boaz? Rahab, the former prostitute, a woman of the night who once did her business, plied her trade in Jericho, but who had come to trust only in the God of Israel and her family was saved from destruction when Jericho was attacked. She hung a red thread, a rope, out of her window. Reminds me again of how that Blood of Christ will be what the Lord God will look at to see whether or not He would save us. It's there. It's our protection. Rahab, a notorious woman, 
That's boy's mom. And boys beget Obed of Ruth, a Moabitess woman. And Obed beget Jesse. And Jesse beget David the king. So who is Ruth? She's the what? Great grandmother of David. And David beget Solomon of her that had been the wife of Urias. Another scandalous, shameful episode. David's terrible, adulterous relationship with Bathsheba, whom God dealt with him about. You will notice here, God doesn't mince his words. He points out, she is the wife of Uriah. David took another man's wife, Bathsheba. But again, these four women, right, all involved in some way, okay, they're Gentiles. With the exception of Ruth, they, the rest were, had a scandalous past. And yet they are in the family line of Jesus Christ, in the genealogy, the only women that were ever mentioned in the genealogy. All four were Gentiles. You see, this is even consistent with the picture of the, the redemption and, and of Christ's relationship with His church. Why? Because when He goes and He redeems His church, you know something? She was not beautiful. She was covered with sin and filth. Ephesians 5 tells us that how that He, that Christ, by the washing of the Word, Right, washing of water by the word. What happens in his ministry towards the, his redeemed? They will be washed, they will be cleansed, they become purer each day. Not on the wedding day, not on the first day when he took her. I don't know if you see that a picture here because God's not done with each and every one of us. You see, the Lord's not interested in where you are now. Where you are now, some of us, yes, things have been messed up. There have been a lot of problems and issues in our life or in our history and our past. And we ask the question, how can God ever use me? And understand this, He's not interested in where you are now, but He's, take, he's taking us on a journey where He will be dealing with us, transforming us in greater Christ-likeness so that we can be the person who is at the end of the destination that he can use for his glory. And in all that, the world, one day, everyone's going to marvel. Why? Because, you see, it's like one, one author put it this way. God's going to work in our lives. He doesn't, he's going to put on the greatest show on earth, right? And he doesn't go out and pick all the best, most intelligent, most good-looking dogs who can perform all these tricks. He gathers the lame, the blind, the broken, right? The crazy dogs. And then through his skill, he changes and transforms them into becoming world-class. Christian, it's not about your performance. But it's about the work of sanctification that the Lord is going to perform in your life and mine to become someone and something that He can use to His glory. Why? Because at the, when the, everyone looks at the before and after, they are not going to say, wow, look at Him. Look at how amazing He is. So guapo. So. No. What's going to happen is this. It says, look at Him before and look at Him now. And look at what God did. It's amazing because it literally takes a miracle to be able to turn this guy into something. Why? Because he was so messed up. And God can take our mess and transform it into something that is blessed. You get down to verse 16 and you see, And Jacob beget Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, 
who is called Christ. And you know something? Even in the, the, the birth of Jesus Christ, God's not concerned about appearances. Here was a woman that almost got stoned to death because everyone suspected she committed fornication. Carry the baby, she's never had a man before. No one's going to understand. Don't expect everyone to understand. You, know, you follow the law and you obey him. The world's not going to understand. They're going to mischaracterize you. But you know what? Keep doing right. Mary never stopped doing what was right. And the Lord used that. And there was a son. And she would become what? One of the, the most famous of all mothers. The Lord doesn't use people that you know God's not interested in like people that fit some mold of perfection God's not limited by by that he's not limited by your problems and your issues Abraham Sarah they were what guess what Sarah was his was Abraham's half sister and barren and Genesis 21 verse 5 says this, And Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born unto him. And Sarah said, God had made me to laugh so that all that here will laugh with me. She never expected how things would work out that way. But God is able to work in ways that none of us can ever expect or imagine. And she said, and she said Who would have said unto Abraham that Sarah should have given children suck? It says, in her old age, she said, it's amazing, I'm breastfeeding a child. Wow. For I have borne him a son in his old age, and the son grew and was weaned. Alright? Now, we have anxiety very often over doing God, things God's way. But here, Boaz and Ruth committed themselves to letting God work things out even when they cannot figure out how it was going to work. Right? We fear because not only it won't work out, it may backfire. We fear that we will look foolish before others right? if we were to trust God completely. We fear that maybe it, if it's going, not going to work out, that we will be left disappointed. Because we didn't get our way. When you look at Joshua chapter 6, in the first five verses, do you realize this? That at Jericho, they were given instructions to go round the city. Right? Verse 3. And ye shall compass the city, all ye men of war, and go round the city once. Thou sh thus shalt thou do six days in silence. God didn't want them to bring the might of their army to, in, to launch an attack. They just wanted them to go around the city, restrain themselves, depend entirely on God, and while the rest of the world was laughing at them, they marched around the city in silence. Then on the seventh day, it says that the, the priest shall come, shall bear before the ark seven trumpets or ram's horns, and the seventh day ye shall compass the city seven times. They'll go, go around seven times, not just once. And the priest shall blow with the trumpets and it shall come to pass that when they make a long blast with the ram's horns and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout and the wall of the city shall fall down flat and the people shall uh, send up every man straight before him. And where was man's input? None. God was going to fight the battle. God was going to deal with the thing. And you know why? Because that no flesh shall glory in His presence. No one will be able to claim the credit, not even Joshua. Amen. And we need to realize sometimes here is that we, we, we uh, look at ourselves in the mirror and we see, okay, I, we have this problem, we have that problem. My wife and I, we have these issues and we have this past and all this background and whatever. And how is God going to do any, do use anything? He's going to do it, you know why? So that you and I cannot receive the glory. We're not going to get the credit. He will get the credit. He will get all the glory. Because it's not going to be about your performance, nor your merit. I 
I think by now it should be clear that as I bring this across to everyone, there is a very different viewpoint from what most of us have been conditioned to think. I need to say this because there are some of us sitting here that have been holding back. Maybe we're ashamed of the past. We've been ashamed of what has happened. We've had our failures also. Sometimes it's not because of something we had done, but because of things that happened or things that were done to us. And other times it may have been our failures. We have fallen flat on our faces. But can I say this, Christian? It's time to stop looking behind. You need to look ahead. Right? Not only look ahead, it's time to stop looking across. It's time to start looking, keeping your eyes up this way on the Lord, where He is leading us. And then, you know something? Step forward boldly to seek out His plan and to do it. Stop letting it hold you back. Whether it's in an area of service or an area of commitment or an area of obedience. Some of us here, we have decisions that need to be made and we have no idea how it's going to work out. Do you realize Boaz and Ruth, as much as they have declared their intention to marry and their love for one another, they had no idea how this was going to work out. Only God, the Lord can fix this. But they decided they were not going to elope, not going to take things into their own hands. All right? And here's the thing. The Lord worked it out. The near, nearer kinsmen declined the offer. And now the way was open with everyone's blessings. With everyone's blessings. All the witnesses, the people of the town, they are rejoicing. They are praying for this couple. Look at verse 13. So Boaz took Ruth and she was his wife. They got married. There was a wedding. There was a celebration. And when he went in unto her, the Lord gave her conception and she bare a son who will carry the name of Malon. Right? All the way down. That was a gift of a blessed marriage. This was the blessing of an impossible marriage. Boaz, the much older man, who by that time had realized that the odds of him ever getting married had diminished. Almost zero. And can I say this? Because some of you guys here probably think you've, you're past age. You, are, you have already hit the expiry date. If the Lord can do this in the case of Boaz, his arm is not limited. Ladies, I hope you hear that. You who are thinking, oh, the expiry date was a long, long time ago, before the flood. He was a bachelor, wealthy, respected, but no longer eligible. Ruth 3 verse 10 says this, right? He told, he told Ruth, Blessed be thou of the Lord, my daughter, for thou hast showed more kindness in the latter end than at the beginning, inasmuch as thou followest not young men, whether poor or rich. Now, when she came to him and said, Marry me, right? Redeem, be, my, be the kinsman redeemer. He says, Wow, you're, you're so kind and gracious to me. I don't deserve this. All right, he says, you could have your pick of any young man that you wanted. Right? You can follow your heart and passion and marry someone, a young man but poor, or you can follow the money, a young man who's rich. But either case, why me? I'm an old guy. Past expiry date. The blessing of an impossible marriage, that was the blessing of a good wife. Whoso findeth a wife, findeth a good thing. And obtain the favor of the Lord. Proverbs 18, verse 22. Of all the things, remember, Boaz was a very wealthy man. Of all the things, his wealth 
There was no greater treasure than Ruth. You realize that? No greater treasure than Ruth. Oh, by the way, we didn't get to do deal with Matthew 13 and one of the parables in there during the conference. But our Lord Jesus Christ was described that way, that when he found a pearl of great price in the field, you know what did he do? He sold everything that he had to buy that field so that he can have that pearl of great price. Wow, men, think about that. That in your heart, you're prepared to give all for her. Because that's exactly what our Lord Jesus Christ did. I'm not just talking about soppy, romantic stuff in the, in the drama. This is the example of our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, wait, wait, hang on, hang on. Let's look at, what is a pearl? Hmm? Can anyone tell me, how do you get a pearl? It's a piece of dirt inside the oyster that causes irritation. And with that irritation comes these tears that the oyster will shed that will coat this thing over and over and over again. And that coating gets thicker and thicker and thicker until it becomes something shiny, lustrous and beautiful, a pearl. But what's at the heart of it? Piece of dirt. That was the pearl of great price. His church. That's all we are. A speck. Worthless. Piece of dirt. That describes you and I before we're saved. And then what happens? Over each layer, over and over again, with growth, with spiritual growth and maturity, and we continue to allow, allow the Lord to work in our lives, and we surrender to Him, to His truth as He builds us up. And then, you know what happens? It becomes something beautiful, something amazing, something priceless. You know, I... Uh, I had some previous trips where I went to Myanmar and when I crossed the border into Myanmar, I, I went to some of those shops and you know, those pearls that they get from the Andaman Sea are beautiful. It's a different color. There is a dark gray color, but it's shiny at the same time. It's a different shade. You know, pearls, the natural pearls fetch a very high price. Okay. Never forget where we start from. Just a speck. There was the blessing of a good wife, the blessing of a virtuous woman. Right? Ruth 3 verse 11, it says, For all the city of my people doth know that thou art a virtuous woman. Boaz must have been laughing to himself because when the kin nearer kinsman declined the offer, Boaz knew he got the better part of the deal. It wasn't the land. Okay? He could have given up the land, and the thing is this, Ruth was worth it all. Who can find a virtuous woman, right? Proverbs 33, 31 verse 10, for her price is far above rubies. More valuable than that. Men, I think we need to be reminded of that over and over again. She is more precious than your car or your job or that new computer. The heart of her husband does safely trust in her so that he shall have no need of spoil. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. There was the blessing of a hard-working, faithful wife. Ruth 2 verse 11. That it had fully been showed me all that thou hast done unto thy mother-in-law since the death of thy husband, how thou hast left thy husband and thy father and thy mother and the land of thy nativity, and art come unto a people which thou knewest not heretofore. Boaz also received the blessing of a woman of faith. Ruth 2 verse 12. It says, the Lord recompense thy work and a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel under whose wings thou art come to trust. Now, here's the thing. 
ladies, you have to be in the right place such that the man in that situation is able to recognize those attributes. Boaz was a hard-working man. Okay? He's wealthy, but he's hands-on. He's not afraid to get his hands dirty. And when he was there, he noticed this woman who was exceptional. Why? She was not afraid to get her hands dirty. She worked hard from morning all the way, taking only a short break. Right? She eats and then gets straight back to work. She does this loyally to help her mother-in-law. Right? And here, Boaz notices all these qualities about her. Can I say this, ladies? You are not going to have someone recognize and discover these qualities in you in a singles bar. You're not looking for that. You're looking for other things. They want to know how long your legs are, how short your skirt is. Right? How easy you are. Ruth had the blessing of a loving, kind, gentle husband. Right? He married her out of a deep love and respect for her. For he married her for her deep faith in God. Right? He married her in spite of her being a Moabitess. And then there was the gift of a son and a grandson. So Boaz took Ruth, verse 13, and she was his wife. And when he went in unto her, the Lord gave her conception and she bare a son. All right? The blessing of a son in Boaz's old age. Again, not just, this was, be, no, this was beyond what Boaz had expected to get married in his age. And then now to have a son. Wow. Little did they know that this will become an illustrious family. Right? Because their grandson, is it? Great grandson will be David, the king. Right? Blessing of a son for Ruth who was widowed and childless. The blessing of a son who will carry on Malon's name. Right, blessing of a new family for boys and Ruth. The blessing of a also of a proven, a godly mother who took care of her mother-in-law before marrying Boaz. All right, the blessing of a grandson for Naomi, who had given up hope. Right, she never thought it was ever going to happen. And so here, people come now and they come to Naomi to rejoice. Look at verse fourteen. The woman, women said unto Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, which had not left thee this day without a kinsman, that his name may be famous in Israel. And he shall be unto thee a restorer of thy life, and a nourisher of thine old age, for thy daughter-in-law which loveth thee, notice this, which is better to thee than seven sons had borne him. Wow! What a testament of Ruth. They actually tell Naomi what you are so blessed as a mother-in-law because Ruth as your daughter-in-law is even better than seven of your own sons combined. You know something? That ought to make us think a bit about our attitudes, our perspective concerning our relationship with our mother-in-law. Hmm? You see what I'm saying here? As a determined also that as a daughter-in-law that, you know something? You can be a great blessing to your mother-in-law. Commit to doing what's right. Right? They bless God for His mercies to Naomi. Now, Naomi had to go on a journey of faith to come to this point. It doesn't just come overnight because w when you see the end of chapter 1, she was unable to see the blessings. But now, it's clear. Not only can she see it, other people can see it. These women came and they celebrated. They rejoiced for her. Right? 
God did not forsake her, left her with a kinsman to carry on the family name. It will become a prominent name in the future because the future king of Israel is in their family line, David. Right? God is a restorer of her life. She's no longer bitter, but now a blessing to others, including her grandson. God has nourished her in her old age, and God has given to her a wonderful daughter-in-law. And so what happens? Now she has the joy and privilege of taking care of her grandson in her old age. Verse 16, And Naomi took the son, the child and laid it in her bosom and became nurse onto it. Beyond what we can imagine. I'll end with this thought here. Ephesians 3 verse 20 and verse 21. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Notice this, the power that worketh in us. Alright. Unto him, the Lord, who is able to do exceedingly abundantly. Alright. Beyond what we can even imagine or think. Beyond your comprehension. Beyond your expectation. According to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. Many times we ask and you know what, we limit God in how we ask because we cannot imagine that God is going to deal with things in a different way. All right? The Lord resolved this thing when we get to the end in a manner that we never expected. And even where there was a roadblock, right, and there was an obstacle in the path to His plan and His will, the Lord is able to resolve it again. So many times this was unexpected. Right? They didn't expect that they would end, uh, Ruth would end up in Boaz's field. Right? Naomi didn't expect that, wow, that Boaz just so happened also to be a near kinsman and that there's a way to deal with this, with the situation they're in and that it was not a dead end after all. Right? And so even when that was, turns out there was a, going to be a nearer kinsman, the Lord worked it out that the Nero kinsman was only interested in purchasing the land but not in okay, redeeming and then carrying on the name of Malon and so he backed out we just finished the reading here it says verse 18 now uh, these are the generations of Perez Perez began Hezron and Hezron beget Ram and Ram beget Aminadab and Aminadab beget Nashon and Nashon beget Salmon and Salmon beget Boaz and Boaz beget Obed. That's their son. And Obed beget Jesse. And Jesse beget David, the second king of Israel. Now do you see that the, the reason why Ruth is also there? To establish Okay, the family line of David, it documents it. And then because of that, it documents also the family line of the Lord Jesus Christ. When we come, as we come to this, the end of this journey here, realize this. So many times, okay, we get derailed in this path in our life because bad things happen. And Jesus said, it, you know, offenses needs, must need to come. It's going to happen. Bad things will happen. It's a matter of time. If, has not, if things have not happened to you, they probably will in the near future. Right? There's no guarantee that you and I will get to live in a care, trouble-free and carefree life. But the thing that the Lord promises to us is this, that he says, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. He will be with us even in prison, even in affliction, even in suffering, even in death, even in trouble, even under persecution, even during the times of blessing. But the question for us is this, as we go through every single one of those situations, 
Where are your eyes? Are they upwards? Or are they focused on people? Or are they focused on our circumstances? And like Naomi, on our pain. There is one person who can deal with that pain. God himself. He gives to every believer the Holy Spirit of God, whose name is called the Comforter. One of God's titles is called he, that He is the God of all comfort. Right? Who is able to comfort us in any situation, right? In any trouble. Who is able to erase the pain such that we can forget about the past and we can move forward. As I close here today, realize this. The path from bitterness to blessedness requires Naomi to change her perspective and to look in a very different direction. Instead of looking down, looking inwards, and many of us who are hurting, whether we look inwards, we look at our circumstances, we look at other people, we look at the ones who have created trouble in our lives. It took a series of events for Naomi to start to look upwards that God has been still there and still working behind the scenes. And we must trust Him. Today, as we close this message here, understand, His hand is stretched out to us. But will you take it? Right? Will you follow Him? Right? Change our focus away from our situation, our own pain, our own hurts, right? our own problems. And let him be the one to lead and direct. Just take his hand. Right? Let him bring us to where we can be productive and fruitful for him again. Okay? It took these four chapters and of that journey where Naomi now goes back to her old name, Naomi. She can now smile. She can now rejoice where once it was just pain and tears. Right? But, listen, the ball is in your court. You now have to choose. Am I going to embrace, continue to embrace this situation, my pain, to cling on to it, cling on to my bitterness? Remember, God asked Jonah, he says, do us thou to be angry. And you know what? He was bitter. He says, bitter all the way unto death. He became suicidal. He asked to die. And we can be the ones to hold on to that or we can be the ones to let go. Are you prepared to let go today? Right? Take his hand. Let him take you, lead you. Let him deal with the rest. You don't need to figure out how to. That's his problem. You just need to come before his throne of grace right, and allow him to take control of your life. Right? Like I said, ball is in your court. Your choice. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time. Thank you for reminding us about these truths in your word and Lord, for the example of your people whom you have worked. And Lord, that we see your mighty hand we see your hand of mercy and we see how you have restored even your saints from a place a dark pit a place of despair to a place of blessedness and lord we come before you right now and we ask lord that you help us to take courage to come and to deal seriously with you at the altar in this time of prayer lord that we will hand all these problems and all these troubles to you, our pain and all the things that have happened and our past and our background and everything that should hinder us from our fruitfulness and our usefulness to you, Lord. And Lord, we just beg and plead with one message, Lord. You take over. And help us, Lord, that we, when we come, we leave it here at the altar. We're not going to walk it back to our seats. It all belongs to you. But will you take hold of our lives, and then use it also for your glory. We thank you for what you're about to do. Lord, have your way with us. Give us 
grace and courage and we ask this in Christ's name we pray. Amen, Pastor.